Father, we thank you for the day. Thank you for your goodness. And thank you because every day you pour out your blessings. You load your people with your blessing. And we're asking today that you load everyone Amen. with your mercy. Amen. With the message. And with everything we need to make us as professionals, as ministers, to make us fruitful in your way, in a rewardable way, in Jesus' name. Confirm your blessing upon everyone. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. We're talking about purging. That the purged minister may bear more fruit. On Friday, we started, and I started with the Father purging us. Now, today, we're going to talk about Christ. The Son is on part in purging us tomorrow. As we come to the climax, I'll be talking about the Holy Spirit. What part the Holy Spirit has in Purging us. And I pray as we go through this series, your life will never be the same again in Jesus' name. The topic today is Christ's purging and pattern for the Christian ministers, Christian ministers and Christian professionals, the people that come to Christ, the Lord makes us better. He takes us higher and he gives us more fruit. How does he do that? In Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14, it says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You find some what's there, dead works. Dead works are the works of a dead man. A man who has not got life in Christ, he doesn't have eternal life, and he's dead in trespasses and sins, all the works of his son, all the work of service, all the work of worship, they are regarded as dead works because they are the works of the one who is dead without life in Christ. But then it says, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit uh, offered himself without spot to God. Now that offering of Christ, that blood of Christ, purges us, purges our conscience, purges our spirit, purges our soul, and he purges our personality so that we can bear fruit. In verse 15, it says in verse 15, and for this reason, for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, the new covenant, that by the means of his death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, the Old Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now, he purges us and then he sets a pattern for us that as we are purged, as we are cleansed, as we are transformed by the cleansing blood of the Lamb. Now he sets a pattern in First Peter chapter 2, reading there from verse 21. It says, For even hereunto were ye called, were called to repentance, were called to redemption, were called to righteousness, were called to salvation, and were called to separation from the world, and were are called to the service of the Lord. But then he says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, leaving us a model, leaving us a pattern that ye should follow his steps. As I said, we're talking about Christ's purging and pattern for the Christian ministers. We're looking at three things in the message today. Number one is Christ's members purged and patterned after Christ. Number two is consecrated messengers 
purified and prepared for his commission. Number three, commissioned ministers, prayerful and powerful in Christ likeness. Let's look at number one there. Number one is Christ's members, members of Christ, members of the body of Christ, members in Christ, purged, patterned after Christ. It tells us in First Corinthians chapter 12 the fact that we're members of Christ that were part of him, that as your hand is a member of your body in the same way, the Christian, the convert, the child of God, and the one who has been saved by grace and transformed into a new creature, the way your hand is part of you and the way your hand is a member of your body now. Every true believer, Bible believer, and who lives out the word of God by the transforming grace of God, he becomes a member of Christ. It says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18, but now as God said, members, everyone of them in the body as it has pleased him. It sets the hand, it sets the feet, it sets the ears, it sets the eyes in the body to complete the body as it has pleased him. It tells us in verse 27, in verse 27, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. You think about yourself, you are not thinking of yourself as an isolated block isolated member because when the member is cut off that member is useless that member becomes dead and dry and there is no life in it but in connection with the body that is what Christ in connection with him that redeemed us it says we are at this present time the body of Christ and members in particular and in verse 28 in verse 28 it says and God has set some not everybody but he has set some in the church first apostles secondly prophets and thirdly teachers and after that miracles and then gifts of healings and helps and governments administration and diversities of tongues he sets us in the body that is the fact that we are members of christ now the purging in Malachi chapter 3 verse 3. Malachi chapter 3 verse 3. And ye shall sage he, the purifier. He, the one who is going to purge and cleanse and purify and make us fit for the kingdom and for the service in the kingdom. He shall siege as a refiner and purifier of silver and he shall Purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. The children or the sons of Levi are the people that are called to the service of the tabernacle. But now Christ has tabernacled with us. He dwells with us. And he is now the final word of the heavenly father. Is the final a service and sacrifice and he calls us the ministers who are now the sons of Levi in this generation and in this uh, in this dispensation and he will put them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness Christ members purged and patterned after Christ. Look at three things here. Number one, the pattern of Christ for all his members. The pattern, the model, the example of Christ for all his members. Am I a member? Yes. What's my pattern? What's my model? And what example do I follow? 
the pattern Christ has laid down. The model Christ has laid down. The example Christ has laid down. The pattern of Christ for all his members. Number two, the purging by Christ our mediator. The purging by Christ, our mediator. Number three is the purity of the cleansed after his model. Let's look at number one. Number one is the pattern of Christ, the way to live. We, we need, you know, the map. And we need the church, and we need everything we can look at. I want to do this. I go and look at the pattern. I go and look at the model. I go and look at the perfect example that Christ has laid. And then on the basis of that, I now do what I ought to do in Matthew chapter 11. Reading from verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's the rest of restoration to salvation. We come to the Savior. And as we come to the Savior, we repent, we turn away from our past life, and we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as the only Savior. No other Savior. He is the Savior. And he says, he promises as we come, he will give us rest. Look at verse 29. It says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. That is, this is the example we're going to follow. And this is the model we're going to follow. And he says, learn. Learn of me. See what I do. Do you, and see how I live and see how I please the Father and see how I do the work he has given me to do. Learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls. He's giving us rest in verse 28 as we came to him and now he says as we're in his service and we learn of him and we follow his example, he'll give us, he'll make us rest assured that we're pleasing the Father. He'll make us rest assured that we're going to have reward for what we're doing. Look at verse 30. It says for my yoke is easy. For my yoke is easy. Uh, Moses said I cannot bear all this yoke of these people and Jesus said we will not be like that. My yoke is easy. Like I just said I'm the only prophet remaining and they run after my life. They want to take my life and kill me, destroy me and take me out of this earth. He says we'll not be like that. Always tired, always weary, always complaining. He says my yoke is easy and my body in is light. We're coming to Romans chapter 8 and we're reading from verse 29. In Romans chapter 8 verse 29, for whom he did for no, them he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. To be conformed to the image of his son. You know, God has knowledge, foreknowledge, present knowledge, future knowledge, all together within. Is a God of knowledge. Is a God of truth. And he is omniscient. He knows all things from the beginning to the present and to the end. And he knew where we will be. He knew what you will do. He knew that you will give your life to the Lord. He didn't compel you, but he knew the foreknowledge of God. And then he did predestinate. He did ordain. And he did put in place, you have not chosen me, but I. I have chosen you so that you will go forth and bring forth fruit and that your fruit will remain and that whatsoever you ask the Lord, you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. And now, what's the foreknowledge and what's the predestination to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Obviously, if he wants me, if he wants you, if he wants us, if he wants each of us to be conformed to his image, he sets him up as our 
pattern. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, but we all, without exception, we all in every branch of the global church, we all in every denomination, we all, everyone whose name has entered into the book of life, we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. It says we are changed. If I read the Bible and I'm not changed, something is wrong. If I hear a message that goes through and declares the word of God without favor, without fear, without any excuse, without any error. If I hear a message that brings the Bible open and clear and I'm not changed, there is a problem. If I, you know, spend time in prayer in the presence of the Lord, and then I look at Christ, and I plead and beseech the Lord to make me like Christ, if I am not changed, there is a problem. If I behold the life of Christ, if I behold the pattern of Christ, and if I say, Lord, that's the pattern you have ordained, and that's the pattern I want to follow, and yet I am today as I was yesterday, I am this year as I was last year, something is wrong. When we behold him, and we behold his glory, and we see his pattern, we're changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. The Lord, he tells us in First Peter chapter 2, verse 21, he says, For even hereunto were ye called. This is our calling. This is our calling. We're not uh, just called to be, you know, this or that. We're called to be like Christ. We're called so that the life of Christ, the nature of Christ, will be reflected in us. It says, for even here unto our equal, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should, that ye ought to follow his steps. We're coming to number two here. Number two here, we're looking at purging by Christ, the mediator. Purging by Christ, the mediator. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 1, I'm reading there from verse 3. It says in verse 3, who is talking about Christ being the brightness of his glory, of the Father's glory. And the express image of his person upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, taking away our sins, removed our sins, purged us from our sins, he sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. Why did he sit down? Because the work is done. Everything that he ought to do to purge me, to purge you, to purge us, everything that is required that will be perfectly purged and presently purged and perpetually purged that our lives will not carry all the dirt in the stream of the world and that we're totally, completely purged when he had by himself purged our sin, he sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. Uh, look at the next verse there in verse 4. In verse 4 it says, Being made so much better than the angels. What angels could not do? What um, glorified men who are in heaven now, what he cannot do now, uh, we're making a mistake when we pray and we're asking the angels to come. Never, we never invite the angels, whatever their name, whatever their status, we don't invite them, angels so and so, angels so and so, come and put me. Uh -uh. You're giving the work of Christ to a lower creature. We don't call an angel to come and put us, and we don't call the people who have gone, the founder 
members of our uh, denominations. We don't call them and say, you're over there. I'm going through this challenge and this difficulty. Uh, Father so and so, Father Abraham, Father whatever, come and punch me. Uh -uh. They cannot do that. It's Christ. Christ and Christ alone. The Savior. Christ and Christ alone. The final sacrifice. Christ and Christ alone. The only refiner that purges us and it says be made so much higher better greater than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they if that is what christ has done what's my part I agree with Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're reading from verse 6. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, your glory is not good. You know, sometimes somebody has to tell us that what we glory in that is not good. The Corinthian church as a whole church eh, there was something going wrong there. You know the story of the young man that defiled that went into his father's uh, wife. And, and the church they just said we're still whatever happens we're still the best church in town. Whatever happens we at the church you know it's the apostle Paul that came. Paul not all the other people not not Barnabas, not Silas, not Titus. It's Paul that came himself and established the church here and he handed over to us gifts of the Spirit, power. They gloried in that and Paul came to them and said, you know what? Your glory in is no good. What do we glory in in our day? What do we glory in in, our, in your own heart? When you think about who you are, about where you belong, about the attachment and the connection you have with the religious bodies of this world, about your position, is that what you glory in? Your glory in is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven lifted the whole lump, everything we excuse that's a little sin don't worry about that everything we glory in and we excuse eh, that, that's a small mistake who wants to wor worry about that everything we glory it literally live on that comes that we say don't worry about that and then when you look at you know at me, at some other people that they see that little leaven and they yank it out immediately and they say no, that will not stay you say, why is he bothered about this little, little things is bothered because little drops of water make a mighty ocean is bothered because that little insincerity and that little hypocrisy and that little walk of the flesh and that little error and that little false doctrine will leaven the whole lump and that little kind of a thing you have in your lifestyle that is not going to allow you to move on and to move on to perfection. It will leaven the whole lump. That's why when you see anything in your personal life, in your ministry, in your church, and say, that's not of God. And you know, people, those are young people. Let these young people, they're still young. Let them plant their wild oats. And let them do their evil thing. No, that's a young convert. A young convert is supposed to, you know, he might, you know, smoke a little, he might drink a little, but it's a convert, it's a convert. It says, don't you know? That he leads you leaven, leaving the whole lamb. That's why it says in verse 7 now. In verse 7, purge out. Therefore, the old leaven, the old lifestyle is trying to come in. The old pride is straight about to come in. And the old hypocrisy is about to come in. You're vigilant because once you allow that hypocrisy, you turn away from the pattern. And the pattern is Jesus Christ. Put out, therefore, the old leaven that ye may be a new love as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. He tells us then in verse 8, he says in verse 8, 
Therefore, let us keep the feast with not of the old leaven, neither of the old leaven of malice of wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. In Second Timothy chapter 2, here we're looking at it from verse 19. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Those who are members of the kingdom and they are members and citizens of the glorious kingdom of Christ. He knows them that are his. And then it says, and let everyone, everyone, everyone that nameth the name of Christ. Who are those? Those who name the name of Christ in preaching and they say in Jesus' name, who are those? Those who name the name of Jesus Christ in prayer, in Jesus' name I pray. Those who name the name of Christ in singing, and they say we're singing about Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. Those who name the name of Jesus Christ in their conversation, in their lifestyle, I belong to Christ. Those who name the name of Christ in their confession in their profession it says let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity verse 21 in verse 21 it says if a man therefore purge himself if a man therefore purge himself from these what does that mean from these from besetting sin from the habitual sin, from the normal weakness of your life. You don't say, that's my weakness. That's my infirmity. That's my peculiarity. I just thank God for every other thing. Every other thing is all right except this. That one that you point to and you say, except this. If a man therefore purge himself from this he shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified and meet for the master's use ready suitable feet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work we're looking at number three here number three is the purity of the cleansed after following after his model he has set the model. Uh, you know what, um, you know, people who construct, what they do, if they are making blocks, they have a mold, a model. And they pour the cement into that model, and it comes out like that model. They pour in the cement again, and the next block is going to be just like that. Those who manufacture cars of a particular brand, what do they do? They have the model, and every car that they make is according to that model. If human manufacturers follow after the model, and everything they make, everything they manufacture, follows after that model who gave them that wisdom god don't you think god himself was giving us a perfect son we need to pattern our lives after don't you think he'll make every convert in the process of developing us he makes every convert every christian every believer he makes us to follow after his model. What's the model of Jesus Christ in John chapter 8 verse 28? Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, no other one. I am he, the Savior. I am he, the mediator. I am he that brings forgiveness from heaven and gives it to everyone who repents. There is no other savior. There is no other uh, mediator. You will know that I am he and that I do nothing 
of myself. That's the model he left us. Every little thing. Uh, I say, what does the Father want me to do? What will please the Father? What will bring joy in the heart of the Father? That's the model. That's the model. And he says, I do nothing of myself. But as my Father has taught me, I speak these things it tells us in verse 29 in verse 29 and he that sent me is with me the father has not left me alone for i do always when i'm down in the valley when i'm up on the mountain i do always when the pharisees are there when my own disciples are there I do always. When people that want to find some fault uh, with me, when they are there, and when people who love me and they just open their heart, open their ears to everything I want to say, whether people are negative or positive, I do always. Whether there are people that will challenge me, that will criticize me, or the people that will honor me are there, always. I don't look at them. I don't think of them. For I do always those things that please him. That the pattern he has left for us. That the model he has left for us. And he purifies us. And he cleanses us that we will follow after his model, Philippians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let the mind which was in Christ, let that mind be in you. Don't have another mind and don't have another thought. Don't have another way. Let the mind of Christ be in you. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 5, reading from verse 9, it says, I'm being made perfect. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. He became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Yes, eternal salvation. Eternal salvation. Not to the people that disobey him and they say, I got salvation 35 years ago. And that salvation is eternal. Whether I follow Christ or not, I've got that salvation and it's eternal. No, no. Uh, read your Bible very well. It says he is the author and the giver of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. That's it, what he did before the Father. He obeyed the Father. He had the grace. He had everything it took to obey the Father. And now we are converted and we come to him and we interact with him. We are integrated into him. And now he says, I give you my life. I give you my pattern. I give you my model. As I obeyed the Father, I give you the grace to be obedient to the Father. And so you you have that eternal salvation for them that obey him. We're coming to point number two here. Point number two, we're looking at consecrated messengers, purified and prepared for his commission. Consecrated messengers. And he says he purifies us and he prepares us for his Commission. We're looking at uh, three things here. Number one, we're looking at prepared and planted mainly for fruitfulness. Any farmer who prepares the ground, who prepares the crop, who plants, he has only one thing in, in mind, fruitfulness for the planted uh, crop. Number two, purposeful and persevering for much 
fruitfulness. For much fruitfulness. You see, if, we, if we're going to bear fruit, more fruit and much fruit, we'll need to persevere. The farmer doesn't go to the farm only one day, and then he has planted and he says, that's all. I'm looking for the time of the harvest. No, he keeps on going, keeps on going, so that as he perseveres in the work, then there will be fruitfulness. Number three is uh, partnering in pursuit of much more fruitfulness. You see, there's more fruitfulness, there is much fruitfulness, and there is much more fruitfulness which the Lord will accomplish in your life. Look at number one, prepared and planted mainly for fruitfulness. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 5, reading from verse 1. Here is what the Heavenly Father said now. I will sing to my well-beloved song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. He chose the hill. He chose the fruitful hill because the main purpose of that planting is fruitfulness. Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, and he faced it. Why? So wild animals will not come and spoil the fruit. And he gathered out the stones thereof. Why? So that the roots of what is being planted will go deep into the soil and there will be fruitfulness. And he planted it with the choicest vine. Uh, he had to, you know, choose and say, because of the fruit I want, I'm going to plant the choicest of vines and he built a tower in the midst of it so that that tower he can watch everything on the for everything is for fruitfulness and he also made a wine press therein so that when the fruit is gathered he'll be able to process the fruit and he looked that it should bring forth Graves. He looked that it should bring forth graves and it brought forth wild graves. But you know, the understanding is he planted the vine mainly for fruitfulness. Look at Luke chapter 13. In Luke chapter 13, verse 6, and he spake also this parable. A certain man made a fig tree planted in his vineyard, he had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and he sought fruit thereon and found none. What's the purpose of planting that tree? Uh, the fruitfulness, the reason why the Lord has planted you in the kingdom is that you will bear fruit. I hear some people um, you know, whoever, whatever the authority, but uh, they don't follow after the Bible. They say what God is looking for is your faithfulness, not your fruitfulness. That's wrong. He wants you to be faithful. If you are faithful, you will bear fruit. He's looking for fruitfulness. It's not just looking that, you know, you will, you will uh, kind of be faithful, do everything. Even if there is no fruit, don't bother about that. You should bother about that because the main reason why you are planted is so that you will bear fruit. He came and sought fruit. Thereon you will bear fruit. Amen. Look at Matthew chapter 15, verse 13. Here is the challenge. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be, tell me, tell me out aloud, rooted up. There are people, they try. Tailoring, it doesn't work. They try establishing maybe a primary school in their community. The children are not coming. It doesn't work. They try another thing. Maybe they even try politics. See if they can get a living out of that. And it doesn't work. 
and they say, okay, what will I do? I'm going to be a preacher. I'm going to be a minister. I get those people together. I get their offering. I get their tithes and offering. I will make it. God has not planted him as a minister because he failed there and failed there. He thinks the kingdom of God is cheap and therefore I will make him there. No, it doesn't happen like that. Every plant that my heavenly father has not planted shall be rooted up. There are times when, you know, you're in a denomination and then they rotate the leadership and they say the general overseer, the general administrator, the general whoever, this is the chance he has and then his term is ending. He has only four or five years and as the term is ending the ones they are going to look for a replacement and everybody begins to struggle everybody begins to flat fight in this block they're changing leadership and I am going to be the next one and the other one goes around it's like politics in the church and then whoever can fight dirtiest will come there. The father has not planted him there. It's by with dirty religious politics that he comes there. Every plant which my heavenly father has not planted shall be rooted up. I wait for God to plant me. And then you will be a fruit. Not that you know we're fighting uh, and we're blackmailing the other people, members of the same church, ministers of the same church, blackmailing them to put them down so that we can be planted there. You, you remember, and this is what Jesus said, that in every generation, in every branch of his kingdom, every plant which my heavenly father has not planted shall be rooted up. There are people that use a gimmicks. They use uh, gimmicks and they use, uh, you know, they shuffle things and all that. And they look cool in their faces. They look nice in their appearance. But they are playing a game so that they will plant themselves in the position the Lord has not here marked for them. And you must remember, God has a thousand and one ways to approach any plant he has not planted. Every plant which my heavenly father has not planted shall be rooted up. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. They are blind to the truth. They are blind to the gospel. They are blind to the doctrine of Christ. And they don't go to improve on that area where they are blind. They remain in their blindness and yet they want to plant themselves to lord it over you. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. It will not happen to you. Amen. That will not happen to me. <laughs> uh, we'll go to number two here. Number two is purposeful and persevering for much fruitfulness. You're purposeful. You know that what God wants is fruitfulness. And look at John chapter 15 verse 8. Herein is my father glorified that ye bear, that you bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. You will bear much fruit. That's the purpose of God. That's the plan of God. That's the desire of God for your life. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Why should Peter be an apostle? And I am not an apostle. Peter did not choose that. Christ 
chose that for him. Why should it be John that will write the book of Revelation and give us all those prophetic things of the end time? John did not choose that, but God chose him for that. Why? Paul, Saul, of all people, should be the one that gives us the depth of the mystery of the unsearchable gospel of the Lord. Paul did not choose that. He said, I am the least of all the apostles that I'm not worthy to be called an apostle. Stop asking the question, why? Why him? Why not me? Why her? Why not me? Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit shall remain, and that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he will give it you. Amen. When God has chosen you, his mind is that you will bear fruit. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Your prayer will bear fruit. Yeah. Your preaching will bear fruit. Yeah. Your family will bear fruit. Yeah. And your ministry, where you are, he is the one that planted you there. And the purpose of his planting you there is that you will bear fruit. You'll bear more fruit. You'll bear much fruit. You will have converts. You'll have people that will follow the Lord in their multitudes through your ministry in Jesus' name. Let's look at something. Hosea, Hosea chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 1. In Hosea chapter 10, we're looking at verse 1. Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. He's bringing forth fruit. And yet God said, it's an empty vine. Why? Because he doesn't have his eyes on God at this time. His mind on God at this time. His mind was only in uh, on himself. See what I am doing. See what I can produce. And see what glory I have. And God will not share his glory with man. And so because he bringeth forth fruit unto himself. He is an empty vine according to the multitude of his fruit. He has increased the altars according to the goodness of his land. They have made goodly images. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, their heart is divided. Their heart is divided. They pray unto God. For fruit, but the glory in the fruit. And they bring the fruit unto themselves. And they spend the fruit on themselves. And they scatter and they give out the fruit to anyone they want. God is no more involved. They are bringing forth the fruit unto themselves. Their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. When our hearts are divided, God, take this glory. Today I give you that one. And tomorrow you take the glory to yourself. And your heart is not totally committed unto the Lord. A divided heart. And the Lord now says, this is what you do. Look at verse 12. In verse 12 it says, So to yourselves a righteousness. Turn away from that self-glory, from that self-management, and get away from that grabbing for yourself. And turn around and sow your, to yourselves a righteousness. So you can reap in mercy. 
break up your fallow ground for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and reign righteousness upon you. Amen. Amen. Look at number three here. Number three, we're looking at partnering in pursuit of much more fruitfulness we partner in pursuit after all it's not my work it's not your work it's his work it's not your service it's not my service it says service it is not my glory we're looking for it's not your glory it says glory because of that serving the same heavenly father and being in the same kingdom work and we want to take all the people we're not taking them to um, you know a denominational heaven when we get to heaven there, there is no compartment for you know this denomination another compartment for this denomination and the founder a human a leader of that denomination is waiting at the gate of their of their GRA in heaven and say okay come over here don't go that way. That one is, uh, you know, the area for, you know, that other denomination. This is our own. Anything like that in heaven? No. And since we're working for the same heaven, why can't we come together? Can't we, why can't we labor together? Why can't we partner together in pursuit of much more fruitfulness? It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, I have planted Apollos watered. I have planted I will not allow Apollos to, you know, to water because I plant and then I go away as an evangelist, evangelistic apostle. And then Apollos comes and he stays with them here. They won't know me. It's him they will know. Paul said, all oh, that is not necessary. We need to partner together in pursuit of much more fruitfulness. I have planted Apollos watered and but God gave the increase God is the one walking through Paul and through Apollos in verse 7 in verse 7 it says so then neither is he that planteth anything that is we don't exalt the one that started the evangelism that started the crusade and that had planted and had planted the converts in the kingdom and neither is he that water it but God that give it the increase. No wonder God used Paul the Apostle very much because he didn't care to, you know, gloat over the fruit and to glory over the fruit. He said, it's God. And when we're like that, much fruit will come through your ministry. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one no criticism of one another and no clamping down on one another and no erecting of barrier a gauge for another person it says he that planted and he that watered they are all of one they are the same they are working for the same goal and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor you receive your reward yeah. according to your labor. You're serving and you're giving everything to God and the Lord will honor you and honor your ministry. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we're reading from verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and we're looking at verse 1. It says, we then as workers together with him, Walk us together, partnering. We're pursuing together the fruit and the fruit bearing and the fruitfulness. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you that also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. The grace of God will not be in vain in your life. 
the gift of God will not be in vain in your life. And the calling of God upon your life will not be in vain in Jesus' name. We we'll come to point number three now. Point number three, commissioned ministers. Prayerful, powerful, in Christ likeness. We're looking at three things here. Number one, we're looking at proper praying and prayerfulness for harvest fruitfulness. Number two, present power and performance in holistic fruitfulness. Number three, persistent pursuit and progress. You'll make progress in a healthy fruitfulness. Let's look at number one. Number one is proper praying and prayerfulness for harvest fruitfulness. We need to pray and we should have the habit of praying. How do you make a habit of praying? Maybe you, you look at another person and they're able to pray and pray and pray for a long period of time. You say, I cannot do that. You know what you can do? Think of everything you need to pray for. In the fruitfulness of the ministry the Lord has given you. And let's say there is a circle. And you divide the circle like uh, the, the numbers on uh, the clock. One, two, three. And in between one and two, five minutes. In between two and three, five minutes. And four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And when you have between twelve and between twelve and one, five minutes there, and between uh, one and two, five minutes there, you go around like that. Between eleven and twelve, you have five minutes there. And you have definite things you are asking for. You think about the gift of God in your life that you ought to improve. You think about the grace of God that you want to improve in your thinking about the godliness that you want to improve in your thinking about the going of the gospel and the energy and the passion and then you put each prayer item in one, two, up to twelve. And you spend five minutes. You can spend five minutes on that request. You can spend five minutes on that next request. And by the time you go through all the twelve requests, you have prayed your heart out in one hour. You see, we have to develop methods so that whatever our lack and whatever our shortcoming, we're able uh, to do what we are not able to do before. Like you want to eat an elephant and you cut the elephant into pieces. A piece now you can chew and swallow and before a long, long time, you'll finish your uh, elephant of assignment in Jesus' name. Now, we're talking about about proper praying and prayerfulness for harvest fruitfulness. We're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 9 and we're reading from verse 36. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and they were like they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Look at verse 37. Verse 37, then said he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Verse 38, it says, pray ye therefore. Pray ye therefore. Uh, you see, our prayers are so uh, limited. Lord, give me strength. Lord, give me grace. God, uh, give me blessing. They wouldn't know what to pray. But again, pray to the have it to the Lord of the harvest that it will send forth laborers into his harvest. And sometimes we'll pray for those who are already on the harvest field. We'll pray for evangelists so and so, pastors so and so, leaders so and so. But how about 
praying to the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth. Even people we don't know now that God will raise up capable people, effective people, evangelizing people with power and anointing unto the harvest field. He says, we shall pray the Lord of the harvest. And as we pray for those who are not there yet and they need to be there, the Lord will answer our prayer. We're looking at Acts chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 24. In Acts chapter 4 verse 24, and when they heard that, the threatening of the Pharisees of the Sanhedrin, it says they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and they said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that there is in them. Now, look at that prayer. Look at the beginning of the prayer. They have not brought their request yet, but they are going to bring their request. And what did they say about the God they are praying to? Thou art God. These people who threaten their men, and they said, you have made heaven and earth. Look at all the heavens and look at all the stars and look at all the galaxies. You have made them. And so our request is not even up to that. If you are so mighty and powerful and you made the heaven and the earth, you are going to do these smaller, smaller things we are asking. And the sea and all that in them is, all the fish and all the whales and everything, you've made everything and now they brought their request. When you exalt God and your mind now knows that you are praying to a big God, a great God, a God that cannot find anything impossible. And you are not praying to a small God, a miniature God, a minimized God. You are praying unto a God who can do all things. After that, you can now bring your request and your request will be answered. Look at verse 29. In verse 29, it says, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness, they said, you made heaven and earth. We need boldness. That's very easy for you. If you made the heavens and the earth, if you made the sea and the ocean, if you made all the creatures in the sea, we ask him for boldness. No, that's a small thing for you to do. And they say, grant unto thy servants with, that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Look at Vastachi. In Vastachi, by stretching forth thine hand to heal. They said, that, that's, that's easy for you. Because they started with God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And for him to create health, healing, soundness in the bodies of the people. They said that's much lower than what you've done in the past. And you are God, you change not. And that wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. Somebody shout amen. amen. Now, think about what he prayed for. They prayed for boldness. They prayed for healing of the people who are sick. And they prayed for signs and wonders. Look at verse 31. In verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaking where they were assembled together. And they were all filled afresh again anew with the Holy Ghost. And they speak the word of God. Tell me. Were boldness. What's the first thing they prayed for? 
boldness and right there, immediately there. God gave them the boldness, that's the assurance, the other things they prayed for, that through the name of the holy child Jesus, healing will come to the sick. There will be wonders, there will be signs. Check up in the rest of the um, Acts of the Apostles, the healings came. The first thing they prayed for, boldness, it came. The second one will come. And the signs and the wonders, the third and the fourth will come. We will pray. And we're praying to a God that knows no impossibility. The God that knows no impossibility does not know impartiality. And so he does the first one and every other thing he will do. And as we pray here today, the Lord will answer there will be an immediate answer to the first thing, the boldness, and then the continuing answer to the rest of your prayers in Jesus' name. We're looking at number two here. Number two is the present power and performance in holistic fruitfulness. Holistic fruitfulness. What that means is there will be fruitfulness in every area, in a personal life, in a professional life, in the preaching ministry, in the family, in the work of your hand, total, complete, in your life, fruitfulness, in Jesus' name. It tells us in Second John chapter 1, looking at verse 4, the joy we have and the result we have of the fruit in our lives, it says, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in the truth. This fruitfulness will start in your family. The children will walk in the truth. Don't look at, you know, what might be happening now. Something greater, something better will happen in the lives of all your children. And he says, as we have received a commandment from the Father. We're looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 3. It says, we're bound to thank God always for you. Hey, look at that in your own ministry, in your own life, in, in the work of your hand. We will not hear bad news. We'll hear good news. And then we'll be thanking God always, always, always. Every time we hear about you, we'll thank God for you always, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith grows exceedingly. Your family grows. Your faith grows. And the charity of every one of you toward each other Abounded. Everything will be on the increase in your life, in your ministry, in your family, in the work of your hand in Jesus' name. Somebody said, the louder your amen, the greater your miracle. Look at verse 4. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, so that we ourselves glory in you rejoice in you in the churches of god you'll become a pattern and example to other churches for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and all your tribulations that ye endure nothing beyond endurance will come to your life nothing beyond um, your capacity to endure will come to your ministry. And when anything comes, you say, I know I'm going to overcome that. You'll be an overcomer in Jesus' name. We're looking at number three. Number three, persistent pursuit and progress. Persistent pursuit and progress in healthy fruitfulness. Everybody moving on and persisting. We've, do, we've done something now, then you go higher the following week. 
you go higher the following month and you go higher the following year in jesus name you have succeeded here in the next place you are going to succeed look at mark chapter 1 reading from verse 36 and simon and they that were with him followed after him in verse 37 it says and when they had found him they said unto him all men seek for thee look at verse 38 it says he said unto them let us go into the next towns let us go into the next town he was so successful in that place that all men there were looking for him and he said let's carry the success to the next town let's carry the success to the next village you will be on the move and success will be running after you. Yeah. You'll be on the move and signs and wonders will be running after you. Yeah. The joy of service, the joy of success will be in your life as you go from town to town, from city to city. And you said that I may preach there also. For therefore, I came forth. He knew why he came. You must know why you are in the kingdom at such a time like this. It is to bear fruit. You have started bearing fruit. Yeah. You will bear more fruit. Yeah. You will bear much fruit. Yeah. You'll bear much more fruit in your ministry in Jesus' name. Look at what you are today. Look at what you are going to be in the next few months or years. There will be no comparison. Rise up and claim that. Rise up and claim that. Rise up and claim that. And remember, he has called you. He has chosen you. He has put you in place that you will bear fruit, and your fruit will abide, and your fruit will remain. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord. Whatever will not allow more fruitfulness, much fruitfulness, let the Lord push them out of your life. Fruit. Fruit. Fruit of ministry. Fruit of evangelism, fruit of the womb, fruit of service, joy, peace, progress. Let him purge anything that will hinder you from bearing more fruit. A little leaven, a little error. A little unfaithfulness, let him purge everything out and be a plant that the Father Himself has planted. Sometimes the wind blowing will blow a seed into a field, and then that seed. Is planted by the wind there. Pray. The wind of life, the storms of life, will not blow you into a place to be planted there. But the good hand of the Lord Himself will plant you. And you have the mind, and you have the purpose. I'm here. To bear fruit. My brother, you are here to bear fruit. My sister, you are there to bear fruit. Bearing fruit, you will. Pursue. You will make progress.
let heaven know that you depend on Christ and Christ alone. He is the refiner. He is the purifier. He is the one that makes you fruitful. And fruitful you will be. You go forth from this place with that positive mindset. The Lord has ordained and the Lord has planted you that you'll bear fruit. You'll bear more fruit. You'll bear much fruit. You'll bear much more fruit. I will bear fruit. Understand that the purpose of God bringing you into the kingdom, placing you in the kingdom, giving assignment for you in the kingdom, you will bear fruit. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the fruit bearing minister shout, Amen. Amen. Heaven has heard your voice. Amen. Your prayer is answered. Amen. Immediately you'll begin to see the initial answer. And then all the other answers will follow in your life and family and ministry in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love. You joy over us. You are delighted in everyone. Every one of us here, brother, sister, minister, professional. And Lord, I pray the joy of fruitfulness you bring to everyone in Jesus' name. Whatever caused the fruitlessness of the past, Touch all that out of our lives. Lord, we pray all the wasted years, all the wasted months, all the wasted efforts, we pray that you recall them, you restore them, you bring them back to every life in Jesus' name. The regrets of the past, wipe them out. The remorse of fruitlessness block them away from us in Jesus' name. The wastage of our strength, the wastage of our resources that we do so much and we realize so little, change everything in Jesus' name. Fruit in every life fruit of the spirit in your life in Jesus name fruit of service and fruit of success in your ministry in Jesus name significant fruit unforgettable fruit positive practical fruit perpetual fruit Abiding, remaining fruit, rewardable fruit in your ministry in Jesus' name. Let new strength come, O oh Lord. New power, O oh Lord. New ability, anointing through prayer in Jesus' name. You will run, you will not be weary. You will walk, you will not faint. As God was with those early apostles, the Lord will be with you. Amen. Nothing will approach you. Amen. Nothing will bring you down. Amen. 
from grace to grace, from strength to strength, from glory to glory, and from one level of success to a higher level of success in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know it is done. In my brother's life, it is done. In my sister's life, it is done. We go out with joy and expectation that things will not continue as they used to be. Confirm it in every life, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 